Okay, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. This is episode 67 of Blown Speakers. And uh, today we have a very uh, special episode commemorating the great uh, Jason Molina, okay, by people who knew him back in the day. Okay, so first uh, we'll welcome back Walt, Walt Wyman, who you remember from previous episodes, no doubt. And uh, we have two first time guests, let's see. Um, Oh, by the way, I'm coming in from Yokohama, Japan. Walt is coming in from Sendai, Japan, right? Yep. Okay, and let's see. We welcome Koki Ogawa, and you're in Oregon. Is that right? Correct. Yep. Where, whereabouts in Oregon? Capoose, Oregon. Yeah. It's about an hour north of Portland. Okay. Mm. Pretty, pretty rural. Very rural, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and we're welcoming Lars Knutsen coming in from Seattle. Welcome, Lars. Thank you. Good to be here. Mm. Okay, and uh, yeah, today we are talking about the songs Ohia, Ohia. Is it Ohia or Ohia? Probably in Japan. Question. In Japan, it's Ohia. In America, Ohia. it's Ohia. Yeah. I'm thinking. Ohia? Okay. Yeah. So, songs Ohio, Songs Ohio's kind of landmark album. I would say the Magnolia Electric Company, two thousand three, and um, hmm. okay. So why why did you guys choose this album? I guess I'll ask Walt first since you put this together. Um, yeah, this is like this is this album is maybe not. Uh, it's not known as like the the fan favorite songs Ohia album. I think it's known as the. Uh, I, I think that that honor goes to the 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 black album. Um, but I don't know. I just really like this album thematically. I think it it hangs together very well, and uh, it it just like just all the songs. Uh, we were talking a little bit before we started recording. Just all the songs are just really good. Um, uh, and it was also sort of the transitional album. It was sort of the either the last songs Ohia album or the first Magnolia Electric Company album, depending on you know who you ask, right? It was sort of this uh, this pivotal moment in uh, Molina's career, I think, when he was sort of wrapping up the songs Ohia project and moving on uh, to other things, which sadly he he didn't get to do, uh, you know, maybe didn't get to complete due to his untimely death. Uh, in 2013. Um, so that's my take on it. I don't know. That <laughs> okay. Um, all right, Koki, what are what are your thoughts on this album? Ah, it was briefly. a great album. Uh, Walt picked this album for us, I think, so I just kind of followed yeah. it. The only album I have yeah, is, kind of is, is WCD, not WCD, uh, the Farewell Transmissions, the... Uh, uh, I don't know the word for it, but uh, just uh, it's like the a tribute CD, it's, I guess. So yeah, it's like the tribute stuff. album, right? Of, uh, mm, yeah. Covers and stuff. Yeah. Okay. And La Lars, what are what are your what are your feelings on Walt's selection? <laughs> um, you know, I've been listening to listening to it a lot for the past week or so, and it's really grown on me. Um, a couple of the the songs really struck me right off the bat as just classics um, like Just Be Simple and Farewell Transmission. Others um, took a few more listens, um, um, but then they've really grown on me. Um, it's a little bit haunting, um, some, of the, some of the melodies, but um, it's just a really strong album, great musicianship, great melodies, um, you know, deep lyrics as you would expect, you know, from, from Jay. Um, so it's, I've really enjoyed listening to it and it's, it's, um, it's the genre that, a uh, genre that I really got into, um, like when I was living in Kentucky, like listen to Williams, kind of that alt country, um, Wilco, kind of that, um, that really in the late nineties, early two thousands took off and it's kind of in that vein. So I've really, really enjoyed getting into it. Okay. And yeah, why today is special, such a special episode, because you guys all were friends with the artist, so I think it'll be um, 
it will offer some very valuable insight. So, um, yeah, I want to give you a chance to tell your your stories. But um, yeah, I love I love the artwork of this album. Uh, will William Chef? I think. Um, the the front cover and the back cover I think are both both very beautiful. Um, here is a picture of right Jason Molina from two thousand nine. Or at least it's dated 2009. But, um, you know, so after he, you know, he went on to become a very, you know, established singer after you guys knew him. So uh, these are, these pictures are from a few years later, right? Um, hmm. Were you, I guess one, one question. Well, okay, let me do this. <laughs> all right. So you guys, you guys all went to school together in Oberlin, right? Oberlin College. Just west of Cleveland, That's correct. Cleveland, Ohio, and that's where you met Jason Molina for the first time, right? Yes. And so it must have been interesting to see him, right, go on to a certain degree of stardom. I mean, he was very much a, a critical darling, and mm -hmm. um, yeah, he had very passionate fans, right? So were you were you surprised by his success? I guess we'll take, take, take turns. All right, L Lars, were you surprised yeah. by Jason's success? Uh, I wasn't surprised, no. Um, I was initially surprised at how well-known he was, which sounds like a contradiction, but I knew that he, he was an artist deep down and that he would have a following, but probably more of a, of a, of a niche following than like really widespread popularity given just his style and um, some of the themes of his music. But um, I knew that he would have a following of people that really, really loved his music. Um, I just didn't know it would be as large as it was. Um, I remember when I was at a random party in Seattle in like 2010 and going through someone's music collection and they started playing songs of Haya and, and I was like, oh, you know, you know this guy, you know, you know, you know. Uh, I mean, you 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 like um, his music. You you you're a big fan, or whatever. And um, and I, I told him how I knew Jay and everything, and I was just like, wow, this this guy's gotten really big. So, but um, yeah, I, it didn't surprise me. All right, <laughs> well, Walt, what did you did you think? Was he destined? He, uh, yeah, I don't know. Like he, he's. I mean, okay, first of all, I, I don't want to, um, I can't speak for the other guys, but I don't want to present like I was like a, a deep, intimate friend or anything with Jay. Uh, we were all three, to kind of give you some context, all three of us were in the same dormitory our freshman year. And that's like kind of how we met and got to know each other. Uh, and uh, it, it, at least as for myself, um, you know, he, he was like, he was a guy, he kind of seemed to kind of dip in and out of uh, our social circle now and then. Like, you know, we would, you know, he would disappear for like days and then, you know, we would see him again. We'd like, oh, Jay, how's it going? Um, you know, and we were always on like really friendly terms, but it, at least for me, I wasn't like a super like close intimate uh, friend or anything. Um, but, you know, he, he was a good friend, you know, uh, I will say that. But uh, yeah, as for his success, yeah, I wasn't really surprised at all. Like, I, I knew he was uh, a really talented guy, and he was, like, just really focused on the music and on uh, always, uh, you know, always working on his craft. Um, again, one thing that was a little bit, I, I, I wouldn't say surprising to me, but I, I, I thought it was quite, um, I was like, oh, yeah, well, sure. Um, uh it's like sometime in the early 2000s, I briefly got in touch with him again over email. Uh, and he was interested in coming to Japan and touring uh, and, and asked me if I could like put him in contact with anyone in Japan. Unfortunately, I had no contacts in the music industry, but in sort of part of like looking around for him, like I found like, you know, this is early 2000s, like 
it was still early days for the internet in America, but it was very early days for Japan because Japan didn't really fully embrace the internet until I'd say the mid 2000s or so. Um, but there was already like fan pages in Japanese for <laughs> songs Ohia. And I was like, oh, uh, yeah, he's, you know, he's, uh, you know, he's a global phenomenon. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that, uh, yeah, that maybe surprised me a little bit that he was known even, you know, in Japan. Like, yeah. Mm. K- Koki, did, were you surprised by his success? Uh, I was never surprised. I, in fresh, our freshman year, as as Walt mentioned, we lived in a, a dorm, Barrows, and he lived straight across from me. But he always had this aura to him, and we could get into it deeper as we go go along. But he had that special aura to him, where you know that he's he's gonna be out there doing something. And uh, I think the the latest, the last time that I realized that he had he hit it pretty big or mainstream, I guess, was I was watching a movie. It was a I think it's called The Circle. I'm not quite sure. I, I can't remember remember the title, but it was uh, it was with Tom Hanks and Emma Watson. It's a really shitty movie, but for some reason I was watching it. And <laughs> I was oh, can I say that? I can't. I just realized that's that. a, it's okay. That's why. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, anyways, I, I watched end credits for some reason. It's a weird thing. That's how I saw Lars on one of the video games. It's just I keep watching the end credits and. Anyways, I was watching the movie and I was watching the end credits and uh, I saw his name in there and I was like, oh shit, you know, I mean, he hit it mainstream. I mean, it's, uh, he would absolutely hate that movie probably, but um, yeah. it was one of those things like, wow, he's, he's made it pretty big for himself that he went that far. And so I never would have guessed, I'm, I always thought that he would have a underground following kind, but never, never so mainstream, I guess. So. Hmm. so in in those days did you guys see him perform often would he like was he just busking all over campus or did did he have official performances or how did um how did that go <laughs> i remember an open mic that he did um in our freshman dorm in barrows yeah and It was, his style even then was just, it was quirky. Um, He he kind of spoke, sang, it wasn't just singing. It was just like, unlike anything else. And it wasn't really like, it wasn't really, it was good. It was good, but it wasn't like really fully developed yet. And I I don't think at that time he'd really found his vocal range, his true singing voice. Um, But there was clearly a lot of talent and the lyrics were, always really good um but i i only remember seeing him once to be honest on campus that was it and um jason and i jammed a little bit freshman year and we were supposed to play an open mic at this uh club called the cat and we just like and and we we played you know i was playing bass he was playing guitar and we only practiced like twice and he's like let's do the open mic tonight i was like what what tonight like he's like yeah you know it'll be fine you know it'll be fine like wow you know and he just kind of dragged me there and uh and then we put our name on the you know the sign up sheet and then time ran out and then we never played and that was it Uh, we never did anything so (laughs) sorry for the bummer there at the end but um it's just really too bad but i mean there are so many musicians in the dorm i mean at oberlin of course that i'm sure he was jamming with tons of different people but I just, I do remember his just kind of like gutsiness. It just, I, I have like, you know, half a song written that I wrote this morning. I'm going to play it tonight here. You know, that baseline you're doing, that's fine. Let's go, you know? And I was like, so just, I think a mentality that he had even then, it's like, I'm just going to go out there and show what I have. And you can come, you can come along for the ride if you want, but I'm doing my thing. Hmm. So. And go ahead, Walt. Yeah. <clears throat> oh yeah, um, I, I I saw him perform a couple of times. I think I yeah I do remember that open mic thing he did at Barrows. I don't remember if I actually attended that or not, but I remember um, 
it was later in our college career, like maybe maybe our senior year or sophomore year. Um, but I went to a, a concert he was doing in, I think it was the house he was living in at the time with like a bunch of other guys and like musicians and crazy artsy type types. And it was like the craziest house I've ever been to. Like the, every, in my memory anyway, every surface of the walls was like covered with art, like photographs or paintings or pictures done by various people in the house. Someone had done a collage they'd cut up of like, for, like box covers from pornographic videotapes and they made this huge shrine to pornography in like one corner of the room. Um, and yeah, Jay and his band just like set up in the living room and they were doing a concert there and there was sort of a little party going on. Um, and, uh, yeah, I remember him describing the music as, um, uh, like folk pirate music <laughs> and that like, they, they, you know, they had a guy with like, not an accordion, but I think like a squeeze box and, uh. You know, they were playing this crazy, like, yeah, I mean, that was a perfect description, folk pirate or pirate folk music. Um, and, uh, yeah, I remember Jay kept stopping in the middle because, uh, you know, people were getting loud and rowdy and uh, talking, and he kept stopping to, like, shush people and be like, shut up. Um, and it wasn't so much like he was a, being a diva about it. I think he was indignant on behalf of his bandmates who were trying to play but people were like kept you know kind of interrupting yeah um uh yeah he was a great uh you know the couple of times i saw him play i, I remember thinking he really he seemed really natural like on the stage like he had a very uh, natural uh uh like way of communicating with the audience that i thought was uh, pretty cool yeah <laughs> But uh, Koki, did you ever see Jay play? Yeah, of course. I mean, he was never organized. So, I mean, it was never right. an organized thing with him. It was just random places, random times, whenever he wanted to. And yeah, and I think the more organized shows that he did was was in Cleveland, as I remember. He had his mm -hmm. own thing going on back then. And right. whenever yeah. he did something, it was in the Cleveland uh, uh, venues, I guess. And that was more organized over there. But in the college, it was just pure chaos whenever whenever he wanted to, I guess. So I mean, he was always playing in his room, like yeah, at seven in the morning, you know, there was he was <laughs> playing. It's like he would wake up really early and if you walk by his room, you could hear him and his you know his roommate might I don't I don't I don't want to get into that, but um yeah, I don't know <laughs> how they work that situation out with, you know, Jay always yeah. playing, but he just had a lot of music in him. Well, yeah, <laughs> for sure. Well, I think at a certain point, didn't he kind of kick his roommate out? <laughs> that was, that's another story, yeah. 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 I don't know. They got, he got I pretty mean, drunk Well. Yeah, Jason was pretty not antisocial, but he wasn't definitely not mainstream, and his roommate was very mainstream, I guess, more into the drinking, party, and seeing him. I think Jason just had it one night, and like at five in the morning or something, he he drags out these big abs and just lets it loose. Oh, um, wow. I forgot what he screamed. Let the let the wrath begin or something, and he just started going, <laughs> going into it. He well, I, I remember him relaying part of the story to me after the fact. But yeah, like Jay. So one thing, it was like really shocking to me to hear that Jay died from alcohol related illness, because when we knew him, he was almost totally straight edge. Like he didn't drink, didn't do drugs, uh, didn't smoke, um, as far as I remember. Uh, but his roommate was like a real party guy. And um yeah. yeah, apparently his roommate came back one night completely drunk, uh, like threw up all over their dorm room floor, passed out on the bed. And, uh, we all remember yeah, this story, yeah. Yeah, uh, as Cookie said, like Jay, yeah. uh, like I think, well, the way Jay explained it to me is first he cleaned up the mess, 
Right. Then he, like the next morning when the guy was a little bit more sobered up, he yeah, just laid into him and was, um, I think the words Jay relayed to me were, yeah, it was, he said he had shouted, up against the wall, motherfucker, the revolution is here. <laughs> it was something to that effect, yeah. Um, uh, yeah. And I think after that, uh, I think uh, the, the roommate was... Uh, Either Jay or the roommate moved to a different room, I believe. <laughs> yeah. It's, um, yeah, it, it was definitely um, an odd couple situation that was not going to end well, <laughs> for sure. Well, there's a lot of the impromptu sessions like that here and there throughout. Go over with Jollib, so that's, that's, true. that's the way he was. I mean, that's the way he was. Yeah. Oh. It's it's interesting because I've been reading articles the last few days and just your guys' stories are like corroborating all the articles. Like, I think, um, so is it possible that house <clears throat> you're talking about, Walt, was that referred to as the boys, the boys house in one of the articles? I, they, I, yeah, I think it might be, yeah, it might very well have been that house. Um, it was definitely a, a place where a lot of uh, crazy artists live. And uh, that, yeah, from what I've read about the boys' house, that checks out, yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. The pornography shrine would lead me to believe that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, Kogi, when he had shows in Cleveland, what do you remember what venues did he play at? I don't remember at all. That was so long ago that I don't. Again, he grew up right near, I, I think he lived in Oakland quite a while before going to college there. And so he had yeah. his own group of friends kind of from high school and he kind of left, led that double life, I guess you could say. I mean, he had his Oberlin friends and then he had his high school friends and so on. Yeah. I think even at Oberlin, I think he kind of compartmentalized a little bit because it was like well into my time of knowing him that I learned that he had a whole other group of friends that all called him Sparky. Like that was his nickname. Like to us at uh, Barrows, the dorm crowd, uh, we all just called him Jay, right? Yeah. Um, but there was like this whole other group of friends that had a, you know, had their own like nickname and everything. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I read that in more than more than one article. They mentioned the Sparky nickname. I was going to ask you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did, do you think that nickname fits him, Sparky? <laughs> yeah, no, it definitely fits. I mean, any different type of personality fits him, I guess. Is, is yeah. The, he, he liked to have this persona of many different stories, I guess. And so uh, that's the way he was. I mean, he was not antisocial, but he wanted to have a different persona. And so it was really tough to read the guy. Mm -hmm. yeah. Not that he wanted to be that way, I don't think, but that's just the way he was. And so there's always a sense of you don't really know him at all. Mm, right. Yeah, he was a very kind of private guy. Like, I, I can... I can count on one hand maybe the number of times he even mentioned that he had parents. You know what I mean? Like right. he, he didn't really talk about his parents or family back home. Like I, I wasn't even aware that he had siblings uh, until you know later. Right? Uh, he would make shit up too. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think yeah, he, he told like me that he. I think he told me that he was related to Ralph Molina, the drummer for you know, Neil Young and Crazy Horse. <laughs> and I'm like, was he just pulling my leg or just fucking with me? I don't know. <laughs> I still don't know if it's true or not, but, you know. Yeah, I think he, uh, I think he liked to mess with people a little bit. Yeah, yeah. he was, sure. the word impish was basically made to describe him, I think, like both in physical appearance, appearance yeah. and, uh, yeah. and uh, personality, yeah. <laughs> He could be very silly, had a you know, for fun. Oh yeah, yeah. That's, that's one thing. To like, to tell, though, you know. 
What's yeah. that? I mean, he would, he would get into his story and you couldn't quite tell the difference, you know, of reality. Right, yeah, he didn't, never knew whether he was messing with you or not. <laughs> um, yeah, that's one thing, like, about it. If you only listened to his music, you'd think he was, like, the most, like, depressed emo guy ever, right? Because the music is so melancholy. But he was one of the funniest people I've ever met. Like, he was genuinely hilarious, right? Um, uh, like I remember once we were just talking casually and he spun out this whole concept like for a band that he'd come up with he was like yeah I was thinking it'd be cool to start like a just a real hardcore thrash metal band I'm gonna call it Pig Crusher <laughs> um, like every show, like there's going to be no seating. It's just mandatory mosh pit everywhere. And there are going to be snipers on the catwalks uh, shooting people who don't mosh. Uh, and every concert, we're going to crush a live pig in a giant like hydraulic press on stage. <laughs> it's like, it's really dark, but like it was, wow. like, I remember just being like almost crying. Like the way he described it was so hilarious. I remember just almost crying, like laughing. Um, wow. when he was telling me about this idea like yeah he was just really uh, very funny and very creative just always like you know just a fire hose of ideas like <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I saw a picture there's a, a good article in the Chicago Reader fairly long article um, that has a picture of him from high school when he was in a metal band and he just he looks mm -hmm. like a total like metalhead guy, so um, so was he? Uh, but, but I mean, from what I understand, he kind of transformed during his Oberlin days into more of a right singer songwriter, mm -hmm. indie rock type. Um, did you? Do you felt like even from even from freshman year, he he had mostly it was a, a acoustic guitar that he yeah. played more than anything. Yeah, yeah. So he was already kind of in that phase, singer songwriter. Okay. Um, to me, it was. I mean, we we bonded over Neil Young, and 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 I, I feel like that was kind of his thing. So then, when I found out later that he knew like all the lyrics to ACDC or whatever, then or Black oh, Sabbath, yeah. I, was, I was like, oh, okay. You know, he has quite a broad range of musical interests. So. Hmm. I also saw that he liked Sade. It was crazy about Sade and mm, uh, and Kraftwerk. Kraftwerk huh. kind of makes sense to me, but yeah, Sade. Well, do you, do you remember that? Well, I mean that kind of vaguely rings a bell because actually I I was a, you know I, I'm I'm a little bit of a, a closet Sade <laughs> listener myself, you know. Mm -hmm. um, especially the, you know, smooth operator, like that, that era of Sade, I really love. Um, but I don't, I don't remember specifically talking to him about it, but that it, it, it makes sense to me though, because he was just a musical omnivore. Like he, he really, you know, he really loved music, like in its entirety, like, mm. you know, every kind of music. Um, uh, yeah, like, uh, yeah, everything uh, yeah, from he, he would call out a song as bad, even if it was by a popular artist that he liked. Though, I mean, yeah. I remember when uh, we were just walking through the dorm, and um, a Neil Young song came on. It was the first song from Harvest Moon, uh, "Unknown Legend," I think. And, and I just remember Jay offhand was like, "What a boring song." And I was like, who, who are you to judge the, the great Neil yeah. Young, you know? And then, right. yeah, go back and listen to the album. And I'm like, yeah, it's, it's not the best song on the album, you know, come to think of it. But, um, so that was, that, was, that, that was interesting to me as he was, you know, you know critical of, of stuff that he didn't like and listen to everything with a really yeah, critical yeah, ear. For too. sure. For sure. No, he definitely had a wide range of, of vocabulary, I guess you could say. So, I mean, he could go into in-depth with Walt about war and everything like that. And then Walt <laughs> could go into, like, Rush and Neil Young, you know, but that's the way he was. But you can never yeah. figure out what he genuinely liked, you know. 
he yeah, had his own so style, and, and I, I yeah. can never figure out what he really actually liked because it was so yeah. wide. <laughs> his taste was yeah, so he, wide, and he knew so much about everything. So yeah, absolutely. Hmm. Well, shall we? Shall we play a bit of a track just to give our sure. give our viewers a taste? Just a second. Okay, so just to give our viewers an idea, um, this is track three off the album. Just be simple. Hear a bit of it. talk about one day getting out why put a new address on the same old loneliness everybody knows where that is we built that house of his and when he's not home someone else will know always is if heaven's really coming back It's always heaven goes Who always almost tells me the secret How there's really no difference In who he was once And who he's become I think he's been letting me I think he's doing it again Thanks for letting me win And everything you hated Yeah, quite quite a song. <laughs> yeah, I wish I brought a lighter that I could uh, hold up. It's really, <laughs> really get that that sort of torchy, <laughs> torchy vibe from that. But I, I I see what you mean about the gap between. Um, I mean, you listen to these songs; it sounds like just a very mature together serious person and then the, the guy you're describing just sounds so different from that it's a uh, it's fascinating like um yeah of it's course we knew like, him a little bit before oh sorry go ahead no no, no no sorry i'm still not getting used to the not interrupting on zoom I yeah apologize. it's the uh yeah it's the uh <laughs> it's the lag right um yeah yeah, I was going to say, we, we did know him a few years before that, sure. though. Like, we knew yeah. him in the, the, you know, what, 92 to 96 was when we were at Oberlin. Yeah, and that, that song was quite a bit later, like uh, over 10 years later. So mm -hmm. he probably did a lot of maturing in that time, yeah, <laughs> that's for sure. Right. That's true, yeah. <clears throat> that's a good point. Even at the time, though, at Oberlin, like, I can say to this day, he's the most intense person I've ever met, really. Mm -hmm. And oh, yeah. despite the moments of silliness, you'd catch him in other moments of like deep intensity. Um, and you're not really sure about what, like he was obviously preoccupied or thinking about something. And so like, like, you know, sophomore year or senior year, like we just, I might run into him on campus and then say hi and, and chat quickly, but there was clearly something weighing heavily on him that you couldn't quite get to. And then 
you know, you just move on. But so definitely that, that feeling of there's something really heavy going on inside him that was definitely there as well. And so one of the reasons I haven't listened to more of his music is it, it, it makes me really sad, first of all. Yeah. Um, and the music itself is sad often. Um, and then obviously what happened, you know, is, is tragic. But this song struck me as uplifting, beautiful as well with the vocal harmonies. But um, it, it just struck me as like in just an instant all country classic. Um, the, first, the first couple lines, especially, you know, you never hear me talk about one day getting out. Why put a new address on the same old loneliness? That just captures, that, it's such a brilliant lyric because it's like, no matter where you go, you, you still have to deal with yourself and your inner, yeah. whatever you're dealing with. Um, and that really captures that feeling that like, why move when you're stuck with the pain that you have wherever you go? And so that, that really stood out to me. Hmm. Yeah, I, I actually wrote that lyric down as one to mention. So that's, it's yeah. interesting. Yeah, we knew him a, a decade before he wrote that. But I think we all mentioned that we kind of like the song the most, or the song stuck out the most. But I think we're all, I don't know how to say, tune in with the call. We're all midlife guys, you know, who's <laughs> gone through life somewhere. And so yeah, it feels to us in a certain sense, you know. And, and so this is the crowd, the, the crowd of four right now. And, there, but it yeah. definitely wasn't him back then, but and so. Hmm. Yeah, but, like, but, but um, we get it now. I guess in our old youth or older youth. Yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Oh, he well, never had kids, did he? I don't think so, no. Uh, I'm not sure, but so that that early recording that he he actually recorded at Oberlin, right? That you call the black album, right? Uh I, I, yeah, I mean, not, not sure. Officially called that, but yeah, I'm not sure when that was recorded. If that was during Oberlin or after. Yeah, he I don't got, know. He, he got yeah. signed. Was it 1995 or 96 that he got signed? Right. Yeah, it would have been like yeah. our senior year. Senior year. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 So maybe that's when it came out. Yeah. Hmm. Um. Okay. Wait, let's. Uh... That will go on to some of your uh, your photographs, right? So this is from. Mm -hmm. Oh wait, well maybe before I do that, that question I asked off camera, I'd like to ask again now that we're recording. So, yeah, like according to the articles and according to what you guys said, he was just, I guess, out of playfulness, playfulness, perhaps a compulsive liar. <laughs> so why 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 do you think he did that was he experimenting with different personality like different personas you know to inform his um later performances or was he just winding people up for fun or what why do you think he was doing that Uh, I, I honestly don't know. <laughs> I'll, take a pass. I'll take a pass on it. I just, um, it, it just showed a lot of imagination and playfulness. Mm -hmm. um, but I can't really get into his head on that. So, hmm. fair enough. I think this is a theme that we're going to be hitting on a lot throughout this conversation. Um, it's just, it was part of his persona. I, I don't, I don't know enough famous people I guess per se um, but I, I imagine that a lot of the famous uh, people who've made it big have that sense of aura to them where they try to live they, they move it through and, and make the, those personas themselves and he definitely had that um, you could tell right when you met him that he had that aura to him and so, and then we could go further into the deep end where people have their own demons that they're running from. And I think that was part of that as well. So, but again, it's a, it's a re reoccurring theme that any of his fans would probably, or anyone who knows him can go over or talk about. And so. 
<laughs> yeah, um, kind of. Uh, yeah, I'd have to agree with that. And again, also, I think there was just a certain amount of just it, it, it amusing him. You know, just uh, just thought it was uh, like a lot of the stories he told me were just more. I was never sure if he was serious or not you know like whether it, um it, it was stuff he actually well like the story about the pig crusher band i i'm 90 percent sure he wasn't seriously proposing that as a band mm -hmm. but you never know i mean maybe you know maybe he did have plans to execute that at some point um but uh yeah uh yeah, i think a lot of it was just sort of um it was just sort of uh, for fun like it wasn't it wasn't like malicious or anything yeah hmm. do you, do you uh, think... it was definitely not malicious and um, Walt hit a good point that he didn't do it out of trying to do something it was just the way he was I guess yeah hmm. I don't think he was trying to pull the wool over anyone's eyes but yeah do you, do you think the pig crusher band could have been a success on a uh, Oberlin campus oh yeah I mean I, maybe not the live pig part because there are a lot of you know there are a lot of vegans and vegetarians on the campus that probably would not have appreciated the wanton destruction of animals um uh yeah or or the snipers for that matter um but uh yeah I, I mean you know, when you think of that, it's not that far off from stuff like Gwar or, um, you know, like Golgoroth or whatever. Um, I don't know. Okay, let's, uh, shall we dip into the, to the photos? All right, so this is, uh, okay, this is one from Koki's personal collection. So what's the, what's the story behind this photo? I can't remember. It looks like it's Christmas time. It was just a random picture of him in his room. That's his freshman dorm room right there. That's just the way he was, kind of cradling that guitar. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> okay, how about... Uh, yeah. There you go. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I, I was just going to say, like, yeah, yeah, it's kind of interesting. I guess he's more known as a guitarist, but he, he was like a multi-instrumentalist, right? He played uh, bass. Actually, that's a bass, uh, isn't it? Yeah, that's a bass right there. Yeah. Ukulele. Um, yeah, he was. Uh, and I remember once he, he he showed me his guitar and he he strummed it to show me his tuning. And it was like the wackiest tuning I've ever heard. Uh, and the reason why you can kind of see from the photograph that he had pretty small hands. So he explained to me that he had tuned it so that he could reach certain, um, he could do certain chords that would be more difficult mm -hmm. uh, for him uh, you know, with a normal tuning just due to his hand size. Yeah. <laughs> was, was he self taught in music mostly or? Um... Do you, do you have any idea? Like, did he grow up studying music or? My understanding was that he was self-taught. Like, I don't think he took any classes at the conservatory. He kind of, no. I don't know, don't want to say dismiss the conservatory, but he was very much into just like the freedom of, of experimenting and learning on your own without a teacher. Mm -hmm. But I don't know, he might've taken formal lessons before coming to Oberlin, but I don't ever remember him taking lessons at Oberlin. Yeah, I did read somewhere that he had been playing guitar since like age 10 or something. Um, whether he had guitar lessons or not, I'm not sure. Yeah. Okay, how about, how about this photo? <laughs> this is a... Uh, oh, who's that? This who's is that awesome. handsome young, young man? Um, <laughs> yeah, who's that handsome? <laughs> that handsome non-binary individual on the left. <laughs> yeah this this i'm guessing was drag ball freshman year yeah that sounds right Which Overland had this tradition yeah called the drag ball and i don't know i never attended lars can you explain the drag ball i don't <laughs> yeah i mean you would just cross dress you would dress in drag and go to 
what was the disco that they had there? The club? I don't even remember what it's called. I think it was just called the Sco. Wasn't the it? Sco. That's it. The Sco. Right. And then people would dance in drag and that was it. And it was just fun to just dress up and wear some lipstick and just, you know, wear a dress, you know. Um, yeah. But yeah. Um, and um, I just remember like that night, just like just walking around Barrows and just being really, really silly. And Jay was doing these like weird, like he was wearing thermal underwear. His whole outfit was thermal underwear. And he was doing these really bizarre stretches and like, like that and like posing for everyone. I don't know why it was just, I don't know, being silly. And um, I, I don't even, I don't even, I, I didn't realize that you took this, this photo, Koki, but, um, but yeah, that's, that's, we must've been jamming out of, that's my base there. Um, and I think we're probably just jamming like in drag in his room or something, but, um, but you know, I, I, I can't actually, say that I remember it must be too a many. Sophomore year. You I think it was so a freshman year, yeah. You think it was? So um, it, I think it's a little later than their freshman year. I, I did have longer hair freshman year, so maybe you're right. Maybe, maybe it was sophomore year. Yeah. I don't remember him being that social his freshman year. Hmm. Again, he had his own group of friends nearby or locally that he tried to hang out a lot with. And it took him a while to, to come up and hang out with us like that, I think. Yeah. It was a long time ago, whether it was the fall of 92 or 93. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we, yeah we should... <laughs> probably should have prefaced this whole thing by saying we're working off of it's almost by now like it is basically it's been 30 years exactly right or almost 30 yeah years almost exactly 30 years since, yeah. since yeah. our freshman year so we're working off very hazy memories here but <laughs> so caveat blanket caveat anything we right. say in this could be completely wrong <laughs> right that is me though i do know that that for sure that, that is yeah that is definitely <laughs> yeah <laughs> i mean yeah and no, back no when I only had to off. shave, when I only had to shave uh, once once a month. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So. Well, not not everyone has a picture of themselves in drag, you know, with, with a famous songwriter. So um, <laughs> exactly, true. exactly. So hey, yeah, there's yeah. that. That's, that's pretty good. Uh. <laughs> I don't know. Jay doesn't really look like he's having a good time right there, though, does he? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I mean, I think if you follow the track of his eyes on Lars, uh, I think he is, he was checking out your gams. Right. <laughs> yeah, could be. <laughs> it's like, come on, come on, Jay, eyes up here. My, right. <laughs> my face is up here, Jay. Yeah, I, I had 20-year-old legs. What can I say? Yeah. 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 All right. So, well, you, you took this photo? Yeah, this is a photo I took. Um, man, it might have been our senior year or our. It was either a senior or sophomore year. I think I took it sophomore year before I went to Japan uh, as an exchange student because I wanted to have pictures of all the you know kind of colorful people around uh, Overland uh, to show my host family. Um, and this was taken out in front of a cafe called the Feb, which was sort of the, at the time we were, we moved to Oberlin, the Feb was in this kind of grotty, weird little uh, hole in the wall uh, type place. It, it moved to a more upscale location later and now it's quite posh, I think. But at the time it was like this, like kind of student hangout, this kind of grimy student cafe bar. Um, uh, and uh, Jay worked there a lot and uh, yeah I think just one day I just uh, snapped this photo um, story behind this hat I actually remember um, one night we were in line for uh, something I think it was either we were either waiting in line to get uh, to get food somewhere uh, on campus or, you know, maybe for an event. Uh, and there's this guy, like a couple of people in front of us in the line wearing this exact hat. 
And Jay just walked up to him and snatched it off his head and said, give me that. <laughs> um, and it turned out that it was Jay's hat uh, that he had you know, he'd misplaced or something at a concert or he'd left it somewhere and it disappeared. And he saw this guy wearing his hat. <laughs> so, and it was hilarious because everyone in line, like this was my first indication that Jay was a little bit of a campus celebrity because everyone in line just started cheering, going, yeah, Sparky, go for it. You know, <laughs> really? Get that hat, you know? <laughs> but uh, yeah, it was uh, hilarious. Um, and again, Jay, Jay worked at this cafe uh, as well as being a patron. And he was always like the most generous guy. I remember a typical like poor college student. Like I would go in with just enough money for a coffee and I'd, I'd go and like buy a coffee. And uh, if Jay was working the counter, he would always give me my coffee and like a plate of hummus and a slice of cheesecake or so. Like he was just the most generous guy. Like. He treated his friends well, for sure. Yeah. 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 And he was working there all the time, I feel like. Um, God, yeah. And, and yeah. I was just like, wait, you're either like, he, I remember once telling me when he was in school, he was working 40 hours a week and in school and like writing songs. And I, I just, which is why when I saw him, you know, like circles under his eyes, whatever, I'm just like, well, no wonder he's not, he doesn't sleep. I just don't know how he did everything. He just was constantly either working studying or you know yeah. playing music or, or telling tall tales that was it you know one of the four <laughs> you know hmm. yeah. whatever the off opposite of privilege is he he had it like he had this real sense that he you know he had to work hard like he didn't take anything for granted or assume that he was owed anything he he worked his ass off like for sure he did he had that definitely had that blue collar kind of attitude i guess i mean oberlin was filled with a bunch i mean everyone was grungy but their parents were fairly well to do and could send them through the the tuition and everything like that but he always had that blue collar I, i'm working for my tuition kind of yeah yep. i think that still persuades goes through his music he has that blue collar sense i guess and that's why he was so so prolific, right? So he he put out an amazing amount of music in a rather short period of time, right? Um, it's I think it's on the Wikipedia page. Um, he talks about how okay, even though he was becoming a successful musician, he doesn't he didn't think that that entitled him to just work like one or two hours a day. Like he would he would spend seven or eight hours a day you know working on his music and writing writing songs so yeah that totally totally gels with what you guys are saying it's interesting mm. yep. um have you have you guys read this the book um this book by aaron osman that came out um Let's see, I guess four years ago, no, five years ago. Um, anyway, she um, <laughs> pitch, Pitchfork talked a bit about, uh, took an excerpt from the book that kind of focused on his days at Oberlin, right? So this this photo, right, Melina as, Melina as an upperclassman at Oberlin College, pictured with the four string tenor guitar he played on the Black Album. Okay. And let's see, there was a, just an excerpt here. Jason's time at Oberlin was really transformative. Yeah, I think I, I asked you guys about this. Um, before Oberlin, Jason was playing in a kind of wild punk slash alternative band with some guys from high school. But when he went to Oberlin, he transformed into this guy with a guitar and became more of a folk singer. Uh, he met like-minded people. <laughs> so, so were you guys the like-minded people he needed to? <laughs> I, mean, I don't probably... think anyone's mind was like his, so I would say no, no, <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it might refer to his, you know, the other his other music collaborators, right. but uh, yeah, yeah, he was definitely a one of a kind. I think. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, this book is. I listened to an, an interview with the with the author, and yeah, this book is 
well regarded, right? It was on the uh, Pitchfork's favorite. Book. Yeah, I've been meaning to read it for a while. I just I haven't gotten around to it. Hmm. Yeah, I would like to read it for sure now. Um, yeah, he had a pretty uh, steady girlfriend his freshman year, as I remember. <laughs> it was from from high school, I guess, and I think they broke right. up. Uh, that time. Is it, that's uh, when he might have transformed, I guess. Sharon. Uh, we, we don't want to. We don't want to dox anyone. But was it was her name Shannon? Was that something yeah. like that? Yeah. Yeah. I remember I she came to visit Oberlin. Oh, she sorry, visited go ahead. quite a yeah. Okay. I, I thought that they had broken up, but again, my recollection is probably fuzzy. I just, I knew that he was, at, he was heartbroken over a woman um, that he what, had been seeing. And he just seemed to have like a pretty deep well of, of heartache when it came to that relationship. But I don't know exactly which, who, who that was, to be honest, but. He didn't talk about it a lot, but there was a relationship that I think was really causing a lot of pain. But. Yeah, uh, he, he never really talked to me about his love life. Uh, mm -hmm. can't comment, but <laughs> uh, I was vaguely aware that there was this, this, yeah, I wasn't sure they were broken up, they were together, mm -hmm. yeah, they were yeah, on again, off again, but uh, yeah. Yeah, he would definitely, yeah, definitely into, the, into the room a couple of times, I remember. And uh, <laughs> I think we were on the all male floor during that time. So there was hardly any females right. back then. And so no women on the yeah. No women on that floor. Wait, did they call that the monastery or was that Yeah, the monastery? Yeah. Right. <laughs> That's right. That was and, the nickname of the floor, yeah. Was was it the monastery and the nunnery? Was that it? So he would he would bring her to his room once in a while, but yeah, I think they went through a breakup during that time, and that's when he kind of shifted into Oberlin, I guess. It seemed like to me anyways. Okay, well, I guess, um, yeah, moving forward into his uh, recording career. Right, so he um, he was active from 90, 95 to two thousand nine. Um, right, so it, even even that's kind of confusing, right? Because uh, he goes with song he songs Ohio is the <laughs> the name of the band up to a certain point, and then two thousand three, the the album we're talking about today, uh, Magnolia Electric Company is the name of the album, but then from that point, that becomes the name of the band. Right, um, which apparently the band didn't know about. He didn't even tell the band that they, they had to, they read it on Pitchfork. <laughs> really, oh, hilarious! Yeah, um, I did not know that. And he was just cranking out music at an insane pace um, during this. Yeah. Time. Um, yeah, I think more so than like the official kind of disc discography would indicate, because he released a lot of singles and EPs and stuff too, right, under various names yeah um well according to wikipedia right molina had a pro prolific career between his two musical projects songs ohio and electric magnolia um magnolia electric sorry magnolia electric producing a total of 16 studio albums 80 ps and numerous singles his overall discography was noted by critics for blending elements of indie rock blues alternative country with his tenor vocal range. So, I mean, just very, very prolific in a rather short period of time, right? Um, so yeah, that's, that's, that's impressive, right? And it, it goes, if it, it goes with what you guys were saying about just his um, blue collar work ethic, right? Um, So, let's see. So this album, of course, it was produced by Steve Steve Albini, right? Who's a big shot producer, right? Nirvana, PJ Harvey, Pixies, etc. Um, 
secretly Canadian. Uh, da, 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 da. Like I, I mean, this is the album that I think especially um, got a lot, got a lot of attention. Kind of like you know, put him into the like he had his hardcore fans up until this point, but this album kind of really gave him a boost, right? I would mm -hmm. say, please, um, <laughs> please interject if I'm if I'm getting that wrong. But um, I remember that this album was was a big deal, right? Like on like. Pitchfork was kind of reluctant to give eight, you know, anything above an eight in those days. They gave it an 8.2, right? Um, yeah, it was getting five out of five stars in certain places, four out of five, right? So it was um, heralded as an instant classic, right, in, in its day. So. And, uh, yeah. So we we've listened to track track number three or part of it just yeah. very simple. Um, just thought thoughts you guys have on the various tracks or anything. <laughs> I mean, this album was I found this album a lot more upbeat. I guess I mean even <laughs> listening to this like two or three times in a row, you could want to kill yourself, but. <laughs> this is one of I, I felt that it was more more of his, his upbeat albums, I guess. Mm -hmm. He has another one that I listened to. Um, let me go, let me go. I didn't see it on your thing. Again, his his albums are pretty convoluted of how he publishes them, but yeah, it, this it, is it, just it the can stuff get very melancholic. Out. You can say, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. This list is only the ones who were called songs. Oh, yeah, so. Mm -hmm. Ohia, Ohia. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think oh, I say yeah, it different yeah. every time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. What is that? What does that come from? What's the origin of calling it Ohia? Is that like how some people Ohio? refer to it? I mean, is it yeah. just how some people, when they I, say Ohio, yeah. how they say it? Ohio. <laughs> is that it? I, I, I read somewhere that it's it's both a reference to Ohio and also to some like Hawaiian plant, mm -hmm. like a Ohia. Okay something or other yeah okay. and and i looked up the plant and it's like this really hardy robust plant that like grows on lava flows <laughs> and mm. i was like yeah i can see why jay might might feel a little bit of um resonance with that like right it's like the yeah um and that's kind of in, in line with his ukulele playing Right, the Hawaii. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There you go. Yeah, I hadn't thought of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, William Schaff was the guy who, mm. the artist who did the cover. I'm not sure if I got his name correct, Wait. but yeah, I love I love the cover art. The the cover art is amazing. Hmm. Yeah. It, I, I was, was actually uh, was a art history major. I was an art right. studio major, so we crossed over in classes quite a bit. But he did. Definitely yeah. had feel to him. Yeah, Koki, you made you majored in studio art, right? Studio arts, yeah. And he was yeah. art history. But, but we had also, a lot of yeah, art classes too. Yeah, because I remember he was always that's a like he's known as a musician, but I my like my memory of him that was that he was also always like sketching and drawing and stuff too. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. Um, okay, so Koki, you had a story where you, you ran into Jason in Seattle, is that right? Yeah, this was um, around 2011, I believe, just out of random, uh, was visiting Seattle and I uh, had the family with me, but we we're staying in a hotel in downtown Seattle and uh, I was going through the lobby and I bumped right into Jason. Um, and again, there's a lot of different stories to, to go off of that, but um, he, he definitely has a, a, a persona of a lot of different personas, I guess. But I think I finally saw him for the first time in that meeting. I think he was traveling a lot at that time. He was traveling with the band and he had a gig in Seattle. And um, 
but you could tell the traveling was wearing down on him. He was pretty tired. Um, but he was generally, genuinely happy to see me, I guess you could say. A familiar old face. And um, for me, it was the first time that I saw him let his guards down, I guess. Um, I think this is a couple of years before he passed away. And so I don't know if he was in the downfall at that time or not, but you could def definitely tell that he was tired of traveling. But he had to keep up that persona, I guess, the whole time. And just possibly seeing someone from the past, it just kind of loosened him for a second. And, and I was able to see that. And it was a, a nice recollection of things, I guess, for me. Mm. Hmm. What um, what did he do or say that um, led you to believe that he was so happy? I don't know. It's just just the way he was. There isn't a single thing that he said or did. It just he just opened up upon seeing each other. I guess uh, it's just that feeling you get when you see someone like that. And. Um, I don't, I, I don't know the life of a musician, but I assume that they're just constantly traveling from hotel to hotel. And just seeing someone familiar, I'm sure just puts people at ease. And uh, that was definitely something I saw in that. Hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, I was gonna read a few, a uh, couple quotes just uh, going out. This is, um, Max Winter, a former bandmate, said of Jason, uh, Jason was large and multitudinous, commensurately inspiring and frustrating, goofy and gloomy, spontaneous and studied, generous and self-absorbed, loyal and flaky, wise and naive, trusting and paranoid, outgoing and reserved, honest and totally full of shit. And, and every blessed and profane thing in between. And it's all there in his music. So does that, <laughs> does that, does that gel yeah, with that, your, your memory? <laughs> it lines up pretty well with how I yeah. remember him, for sure. Yeah, beautiful contradictions. Hmm. Yep. Um, and just commenting on, on him as an artist, um, so uh, Aaron Osman, who wrote the book uh, we pointed out, again, that book is uh, Jason Molina, Riding with the Ghost, which is a track off this album and a song we're going to go out on. But um, yeah, Aaron Osman says of Jason as an artist, he is really part of the canon of great American songwriters. In my opinion, he belongs in there with Towns Van Zant and with Neil Young and Dylan and all the greats. He was never on a major label. He was never playing huge stadiums. I think his body of work and his point of view and his poetic outlook are deserving of that level of attention and that level of study and that level of celebration. Right, so she's she's not mincing words there, right? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. At the beginning, you asked us if we were surprised at his success, and yeah, in a way, I'm surprised he wasn't more famous. You know, like uh, such a talented uh, musician. I don't know. Mm. And I, I think honestly. Um, you know, if he wanted to, he could have been just a songwriter, like in Nashville, writing country hits, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and could have made more money probably, and 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 could have been part of that. Obviously, that totally wasn't who he was because he had a vision for himself and and everything. But like, you know, one of the tracks on here, the 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 um, was it the old black hen? Mm, um, yeah, that he that he penned, and then he had you know. A country singer do it's more, just like that's like a that's like a radio hit there or something or it's, it's really yeah. more of a ballad but um but yeah he, he definitely had the songwriting chops that he could have written songs for all sorts of different people and that just kind of shows the depth of his talent i think 
I mean, I want to hear Lucinda Williams cover some of these songs, you know, now. I want to hear lots of different people cover them because they could, they could, um, you know, they could, they could do them justice um, in a different way um, than the originals, which were, you know, brilliant in their own right. But there's just, I don't know. I think there's a lot of, uh, I think musicians who'd love to cover his stuff. And there have been a couple of tribute albums, I understand as well. So I'd like to, to dive into those at some point. One thing, I don't want to sound insensitive or anything, but um, this might be the conspiracy theorist in me. I don't know what, but <laughs> when I first heard that Jason passed away, I didn't really believe it. Again, it, he had so many different stories and personas and everything like that. It would mm. just go in line that Jason's actually alive somewhere, still producing music <laughs> under him or something. I wouldn't uh, be surprised at all. I mean, that's just the way he is. Well, let, but again, I let's don't hope you're. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let's hope you're right. <laughs> I want to hear Koki conspiracy theories. <laughs> you don't. I, I, yeah, that's yeah, a separate. Yeah. <laughs> a separate vlog, G but that would be fascinating. Yeah, Elvis and JFK. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Jason Molina and Elvis and JFK are going to form a super band. Oh, and definitely. Just... <laughs> there. Yeah, that's a nice. It's a nice idea, and it seems believable <laughs> from what you guys have told me. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for watching and listening. That has been episode 67. Uh, we'd like to thank, uh, yeah, Lars, Koki, and Walt for joining us and sharing your memories of this great American songwriter. It was amazing. And uh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, David. Yeah, my, my pleasure. Okay, and we're going to go out with uh, I've Been Riding with the Ghost. Um, off this album, um, Lars. Why did why did you choose this song? Um, I chose this song because um, the harmony that he's doing with that. Uh, um, I don't know the the woman he's singing with her name, but the harmony is just haunting to me. And it's it uh, from this album. It's the one line that I don't know if it's lap steel and her vocal harmony with Jason's that just sticks in my brain and it's kind of beautiful and haunting and a little spooky. Um, and it just, it, it, it's just stuck in my head and um, I think it's really beautiful. Okay. Any, anything to add, Koki or Walt, or should I let it rip? <laughs> okay. Now, just thank you for having us on this podcast. It was fun. Yeah, yeah, it was. Thanks. Thank it's you. It's been a lot of fun. I really enjoyed. Uh, uh, I enjoyed catching up with these guys too. <laughs> My extreme Definitely. pleasure. <laughs> While you was gone, you must have done a lot of favors. You got a whole lot of things I don't think that you could ever have paid for. While you've been busy crying about my past mistakes I've been busy trying to make a change And now I made the change I've been riding with the ghost I've been doing